Have you ever tried to imagine the future? You will almost certainly be wrong. Futurists, or futurologists, those treacherous terms, try to envision what it's going to be like, but generally, they have a terrible track record. Look at the sci-fi authors of the past. Jules Verne saw a world of the future that's completely different than the one that actually happened. So did Burroughs. Mars is not the world he imagined. Well, sometimes they get it right. Arthur C. Clarke, for example, made an uncannily accurate prediction of what the computer and internet age would be like. Very few actually foresaw the advent of the cell phone, that human civilization would eventually addict itself to the equivalent of a brain prosthetic. Yet, we largely have. That holds true for the 18th century. What might they have thought about things like the uses of electricity in an age when it was a mysterious phenomenon whose nature was nothing close to understood? But it would become understood as other scientists continued to work on it. Now it is ubiquitous, taken for granted, absolutely essential, if not foreseen in the past and couldn't have even been imagined in the days of the ancient Greeks. My guest today straddles those worlds between the past and the present, and how the past helped shape the world in which we live. Welcome to Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by John Townsend, an avid historian, reenactor, and proprietor of Townsend and Sons. John also has a YouTube channel. And we're back with John Townsend of Townsend's. John, um, now you, to switch gears, you do a lot with, with period clothing, 18th century period clothing, and you carry a lot of it in your store. Um, how how uncomfortable is that? Is it is it itchy and wool or what 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 is clothing like? What is what is dressing, you know, and working in clothing like that? How is that? Uh clothing is uh, really interesting that kind of it, as we go back and we study clothing from the 18th century and if you think about that as they would have thought about it as something that was um, you know, standard every day, this is what I wear. And then we think about what we wear today. It is just so night and day. The clothing that most of us wear today is so very, very informal. It's loose. It's, uh, you know, it's many people don't seem to wear very many clo very much clothing at all. And it was nothing like that in the 18th century. They were very, very concerned with their clothing. They thought that it, it uh, really showed you know, where you were at in the society, what level of society. And uh, there was, it just was inappropriate to show different parts of your body in the 18th century. And they were just aghast by that. Uh, sometimes it's very strange though, when we think about what was appropriate and what's not appropriate. Uh, you know, you in the 18th century women might, you know, at different times, they, you didn't want to see their elbows. That was very improper, but hey, you know, if, but some dresses you would be able to see their nipples so you're thinking okay this is really weird you know they're they're definitely strange uh compared to what we think is appropriate or not uh today their clothing though uh, comfort wise it c can be very comfortable for different sorts of people it wasn't necessarily scratchy uh, a nice linen shirt is a very soft comfortable shirt to wear but there are many layers it can be very hot uh, they're wearing lots of wool in hot weather, you know, multiple layers, especially if you're coming from England. But some of that definitely here in North America gets adapted and you hear about people being almost scandalized by why these people aren't wearing as many clothes as, as they ought to be. So, uh, yeah, clothing is, is just crazy. Like the whole idea of wearing wigs all the time or not wearing wigs. The wigs were very very popular in england in the 18th century not as popular here i think for the same reason that heat, heat thing but uh clothes the clothes can be very comfortable but then women are wearing stays and they can be very uncomfortable so i don't know it's here and there there you know 
also too with these with the, with what have been would have been used at the time the vegetable dyes and things like that some of those are not very color fast so you probably would have had and people didn't own very many sets of clothes at least the common person didn't so you probably would have had a people that looked pretty shabby in in day-to-day -day life uh, as far as clothes are concerned is that it, or or did they have better access to it i mean did they how important was clothing to people in the 18th century or, or well, fashion, I should say. Well, yeah, and fashion is is very important. It really says it really says, you know, are you up to date in fashion? Do you have money? It it speaks right on the outside of your clothing, and people are concerned about that through the time period. And in the journals, uh, they will sometimes they're they're messaging to you just how bad off they are by oh i only have you know one shirt left. i only have one shirt left or uh, i haven't changed my shirt in three weeks or whatever and they're they're telling you right there that this is how bad it is um the i don't i'm not i'm not sure about the colorfulness in the time period and that we maybe mistake what if what was available to them in the 18th century there can be very very colorful things colors of fabrics that we would never think that were available in the time period were common or uh, at least available if you had enough money so uh, and they would because that was expensive whether we think our taste may think that looks good or not they would wear it just because it's expensive we know that it happens today uh, the same thing happened in the 18th century like strange things uh, there was a really expensive green paint uh, that is just hideous. But, oh, these rich people would you know, cover their walls with this horrible color of green paint because it was very, very expensive. Happened in the 1950s, too, with yeah. seafoam green, which must have been... <laughs> I see it everywhere in historic houses, you know, that are still painted in 1950s colors. Um, now, as a reenactor, what what do people, what does the public ask you? What are the most common questions you get as a reenactor? A lot of times, very strange questions. Uh, you know, is that fire real? Are you going to eat that food? Uh, those are, you know, strangely common questions. Um, you, know, you know, is that is that wool coat hot? You know, it's obvious. And I think some, sometimes these questions, even though they're very obvious, they're just there to start a conversation and so you know they just don't know the question to ask because it's so uh strange and they they don't have they they don't they don't have a question in their head because it's so alien to them now when you're doing your show and you're you're looking through the cookbooks is there stuff that you won't eat you won't make you know the the recipes that are just too far of a stretch for for even you um do you run across things that surprise you? I, I definitely uh, pull back on certain recipes because I think people might be grossed out by them or, I don't know, offended isn't the word I want necessarily. But there are some recipes that I, I don't bother to do either because they're, they're not possible. I can't find the ingredients. They're too complicated. Um, sometimes if I don't think they they are applicable to people they're you know it's, it's like they they wouldn't be able to relate to it or even i can't relate to what this recipe is then i won't bother with it uh i still you know it's things like cooking cow's heads was very popular and i don't know i'm just i don't know if i'm up for that so do you conversely do you have favorites is there stuff that that you've made that you continue to make just for your own enjoyment or the family requests or something like that? Uh, yeah. One of the, the items that I really enjoy is a, a good boiled pudding, but you, that certainly isn't the popular thing today. Uh, and boiled puddings were just so very, very popular in the 18th century for a couple of different reasons. But uh, a boiled pudding is probably one of those things that I think, boy, you know, let's, let's bring back a boiled pudding uh, because they're fun, but they aren't necessarily that easy to cook in our environment uh we we usually don't leave pots of boiling water on our stove for three or four hours so uh but it was typical for them what would have been in that um is it like a meat based dish or what is it 
Uh, many times you can do boiled puddings with meat, but a typical boiled pudding is like a giant dumpling. It's got flour in it, and you would do you might do one with raisins in it. And it was leavened isn't the word, but I'll I'll use the word leavened with suet. So you would have these little chunks of of suet, which is a very very high temperature sort of fat that. Uh, goes into it in these little chunks and then melts and leaves holes in it. And so it's a it's a, a fun, interesting dish, and it comes out like a big softball, and you, you cut it up into slices, and you can fry that or eat it just like it is and put a pudding sauce on it. So they're, they're a fun, um, different kind of dish to, to make that we just aren't used to today. Now, that's interesting, suet. Now, that's a kidney fat, a beef kidney fat, right? Right, right. The kidney fat out of a cow, there's leaf lard, which is similar in pigs, but it doesn't have as high a temperature. The stuff from cows is really the, the best to use, and it really has to be that organ fat, that very, very dense fat. Now, that dense organ fat, we, we don't use that too much anymore, just like we don't really use lard anymore, despite it being delicious. But th- is that harder to cook with? I mean, does it have a higher melt point? I mean, how is it different from what we would normally use today? Well, there are, it's almost waxy in its substance, and there are people that are very concerned about it health wise. And I, it's health medicine or health science is so strange, food science is so strange about how it, you know, continually is a, this evolving, changing, boiling pot of, you know, this is going to kill you. No, no, it's really good for you. And suet has been one of those things that has gone through that. Uh, that phase. Some people, you know, think, boy, you eat a cup of suet and you're going to die in a minute. And then other people are, this is really good for you. Uh, It is a great thing to cook in. In fact, uh, when we think about how, when McDonald's French fries were really, really good, that was when they were cooked in uh, beef suet. Now they don't cook them in that same, and they actually have to add different kinds of flavors to make them as good as, try to make them as good as when they they, uh, fried them in beef suet. Yeah, actually, I remember Julia Child made that case 30 years ago that <laughs> McDonald's was good until they stopped using um, fat. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, now, I want to ask you uh, to, to move to something different. YouTube itself. We're both YouTubers, and yeah. I do a very different YouTube channel. Mine is science-based, yours is history-based. But ultimately, what we're doing is is education. How do you view YouTube? Do you, th- do you see YouTube as... as the democratization of media, essentially, or do you think that it's it isn't the future? What what do you think YouTube? Where is YouTube going? Uh, it's I mean, having been around as a user uh, from a content producer side from two thousand eight and uh, moving forward, YouTube has changed and changed and changed. Uh, I don't think for years YouTube knew what it was. And I'm not sure that that people even know today what it's going to be next year because it does continue to change. It's a it's an interesting platform to watch as it evolves, it, both as people create content and as you know the the administration of it and you know where they've tried to move it, where they've failed. Um, I, I think it's a great democratization sort of tool to you know bring creating content into uh, regular people's hands. But we see that disappearing, you know, the, the level of content, uh, the quality of content continues to increase. Um, you know, people to be successful, you have to create better and better content as you go along. And so you lose some of that um, sort of community cable, you know, <laughs> thing going on there. But I, I think it's very interesting, and I'll, I'll love to see where it's continuing to go. I, ho- I hope it uh, continues to evolve in fun and interesting ways that is helpful to real people. It is so helpful to real people nowadays that you can search for very, very strange things and get very helpful information. Um, I mean, you might have to pick through the garbage, but there's still some some really good stuff there. I agree. It, it really is a – I mean, if you want to – learn about fixing a car you know or just some specific task it's easier to go to youtube and and find a video than it is to you know read up read about it on the internet now 
What is the future for Townsend's? You, you've been moving into other things, like, for example, recently you raised an 18th century barn. What, um, what is the future? What, what are you, what are your sights set on? As we've been moving forward to a, a deeper experience, uh, trying to bring that to the channel. I mean, I've always done projects for me personally that were, how do I experience the 18th century for me? Uh, but trying to bring that to the channel, it has this weird, strange kind of reality show thing going on with it. But uh, there are reasons why that formula is of interest to people. They want to connect with other regular people, you know, just like you or me. Uh, they, they, that that whole democracy of of media is really coming into play there, and people enjoy that authenticity of this is a real person trying to do a real thing. We're so we're trying to bring a little bit more to that channel with specific projects, the uh, the canoe project where we did a dugout canoe recently, um, trying to actually do these things as people did them in the 18th century uh that's what we're trying to do more of and it's not always easy it's takes can take a lot of time a lot of effort um but there's a, a lot of reenactors that do those things they just don't have the opportunity to or the skills to bring that to youtube and bring it to lots of people. So we have to both do that ourselves and connect those people that are already doing those kind of projects with YouTube and and um, kind of come along and hold hands with some of those folks. How did you make the canoe? I haven't seen that episode. Did you do like a log type canoe or did you do a birch bark? What, yeah, what we did, did a, a log uh, dugout canoe and we got a, a giant uh, tulip tree log and, and uh, went at it with axes and adzes and and chopped that guy out. <laughs> uh, that was a, a, a great fun project and learned a lot. Uh, how to how to somebody that kind of came along with us as a consultant who has done, you know, uh, eight or 10 of these canoes. So it learned a lot uh, about them. And now all of a sudden, you know, dugout canoes are popping out of the woodwork whenever I look at it. It's like when you buy a new car, you've never seen that model before. And then, you know, it's every other car on the road. Uh, a lot of different... Uh, interesting things about you know we think of dugout canoes as native american here but they are all over the world and all these different interesting techniques and shapes and sizes and even uh, medieval uh, ones in the uk popping up in rivers really interesting designs so it was a fun project yeah it's interesting especially in europe with boats they they would even do things like coracles where they would make and i think they still do this they would make it out of animal skins and yeah. you would have and some of these were actually seagoing. These these animal skin, essentially a giant canoe that um, that would, could actually cross the Atlantic. For example, the yeah, Brendan yeah. quasi legend of Saint yeah, Brendan. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so they. So in other words, okay. So you have a wooden canoe, and it still has to be bulky, doesn't it? I mean, is it a is it how maneuverable is it? Is it just easy to no, use as a kayak, or is it <laughs> really hard to huge and heavy? Yeah, it's very difficult to you know. You imagine it's like oh, it's my kayak, but instead of thirty pounds, it weighs three hundred and fifty or four hundred pounds. Uh, it's a whole different kind of experience because it's so heavy and and to, to get. It's hard to get started, but then it wants to go by itself. Um, and you get to experience all that. You can imagine what it would have been like 200 years ago. Uh, but then you also say, well, there are, there are contradictions. You read a bunch of accounts and they talk about how horribly tippy these canoes were. Whereas the one we made, I can stand on the gunnel and it will not flip over. So until you do some of these things, uh, the the history of it or the, what's recorded can be very um, can can really trick you. You, you you're not you don't know how to interpret these things. It's like reading history in a book is reading history in a book, but when you do it, you'll you're going to learn a lot more about what's really happening. Indeed, and again, this this sort of ties back to to the food because you had to burn a lot of calories, <laughs> more calories than we do now. I would imagine, or most of us anyway in the 18th century. So how much food did they consume? I mean, was this, was this sort of a, how were, how were their meals broken up? Were they eating three large meals or how were they doing it? 
to generalize, because it's going to be different in different places, uh, generally that, that middle meal of the day, what we call a lunch, is going to be the heavy meal of the day. The breakfast might be very simple. It might be left over from yesterday. Uh, it might just be a drink. I don't think they're eating as much. They're really burning up most of those calories. And so they they can be heavy, very calorie-filled um, items that we would think, you know, boy, you eat that all week, you're going to die. They're, they're not going to have that same kind of problem um, with that. So I, I think that's going to be the, the quick answer on that one because it's really going to be different for different cultures. Uh, they're going to they're going to definitely be, uh, you know, the Germans are going to be eating differently than the English people here in North America. Uh, so it's really hard to completely generalize on that. Indeed. And overall, though, I mean, you do see old people in the 18th century. So they're, you know, generally, of course, people lived shorter periods of time. As I recall, the Revolutionary War General Henry Knox died in his 50s, and that was considered ripe old age at the time. But you do see people living much longer in the 18th century. So it couldn't have been that unhealthy, but at, with, with, the life, with the active lifestyle that they would have had to have had, or most of them anyway, maybe not the aristocracy in Europe, but with that, that I mean, you still, it was a good life, as I suppose what I'm saying is that, you know, you, you see these accounts where people are saying it's a good life. So w overall, what is your view of 18th century life? If you could go in a time machine, would you go back there and stay for a while or would you just prefer to stay in a modern context? I would, I would love to go back for a short time. I, you know, I'd like to vacation in the 18th century. Let's say that. I don't think I'd want to stay for any period of time. Uh, I like modern dentistry. I can't imagine what, what, you know, the scariness of medicine, dentistry. Uh, you know, the the issues they had with disease was just very, very difficult in the 18th century, and some of their ethical concepts um, are just so alien to us today. Uh, what they thought was right and wrong about different kinds of things, we would just be and are flabbergasted by. So there are definitely things that it's like, yeah, I, I want to go back in the 18th century. I want to experience this or that, but I don't want to. I don't want to live there. Um, it, I think there were some just amazingly good things that were happening in the 18th century, and some just amazingly bad things. Um, and the experiences are are alike to that. There there would be there are some really good things about. Uh, working the way they worked, and then other things that you, we just we just can't imagine the difficulties that they had. My last question for you today is this: Now, the human future. What does looking at the past, the 18th century, tell us about how to go forward in the 21st century? What things could we bring back that were good ideas from that time that we've lost? Uh, that's a that's a tricky one. Um, uh, I would say I, I think there's two different things here. Uh, the idea of being connected with their history that I think we're losing today and that we need to really connect with as we move into the future, that we need to understand our, our past and connect with it m more than just um, the simple, hey, I want to read a book about this. And we lose so much that that way uh, without experiencing what we can experience of what's going on then. And, and there is a connectedness to um, their, our environment that we lose out today that they had. They had these foods that were grown, you know, locally. They knew where all this was coming from. Uh, you know, they, if they ate meat, they probably saw the animal it came from. You know, they, all these things were being grown locally and they had an intimate knowledge of it if they're in, at least in any kind of a, a rural uh, situation. Uh, we've missed so much of that today. People don't know where their food comes from in the grocery store. They don't know how it's made or what kind of giant factory it gets made in. Uh, if we understood all those things, I don't know if we'd eat a lot of what we eat today. Yeah, that's a very good point. If you even just seeing an animal slaughtered, you know, it, it's definitely gives you a different perspective of your food. <laughs> All right, John, we are out of time for today, and thanks for appearing with us, and I hope you come back at some point, and I will definitely continue to enjoy your channel. I've been watching for years. Oh, thank you so much, and, and I enjoy your channel too. Thanks.
Imagining the past and the future can be much the same process. The actions of people in the past are open to interpretation by historians, as are the actions of people in the future by those that try to envision it. We can try to work out what history was like and then apply that to what the future will be like, but in reality, we can't know until it actually happens. But isn't that the fun of it, watching history unfold before our very eyes? We are going to be figures of future someone's history, and they, in turn, will be the same for someone even further in the future. It's the continuum of human existence, and I, for one, find it fascinating. John, I've taken a DNA sample from you and traced your ancestry back to the 18th century. How did you get my DNA? Um, on a related note, your hair loss is accelerating. You know I'm sensitive about that topic, but what did you find? Um, you have a crazy relative. I guess it skipped a few generations and hit you with the interest. What? So what did he do? He believed that the earth was flat and lectured people on street corners. Not dissimilar to what you do on YouTube, actually. I talk about real science. It's the universe that's flat, not earth. Do you have better answers, Anna? Terrible segue, John. YouTube is flat, but earth is round. John, stop. Nothing is flat. Except perhaps the LeBaron's battery. Yeah, and the occasional tire. And on that note, joining me next week is science YouTuber Joe Scott, host of Answers with Joe, for a conversation about everything from Teslas to space science. See you then. <laughs>